This second session this morning uh, is the first session ever in Munich which brings together only non-Europeans, non-NATO members uh, in a discussion. And uh, uh, I'm excited about this uh, presentation of um, um, a very interesting group of rising powers. Originally, uh, I had invited Kevin Rudd, who has been here many times, uh, to moderate and to chair this session. He called us just a few days ago that the flood in his home district in Australia was going to keep him at home and not allow him to travel to Munich at this time. I was extremely happy that really at very short notice, Professor Charles Kopchan of Georgetown University, who is also a very good personal friend of mine, um, agreed to jump in and, and, and handle this, uh, this event this morning. Um, Charles has written extensively and spoken extensively about literally all of the issues that are on the table as we discuss the relationship with the West and rising powers as we discuss issues of global governance. Without further ado, I will hand this over to the moderator who will in turn introduce his panelists. Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. It's an honor for me to share the, uh, the podium with uh, the distinguished uh, panelists. Let me just take a couple of minutes to introduce what I think are the most important themes uh, that hopefully we'll be covering in the next hour, hour and a half. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the international system is entering a period of significant change in the global distribution of power. The Western democracies that have historically been well represented in this conference a couple of decades ago represented about 75 percent of global GDP. These countries now represent about 50 percent of global GDP, and that share will sink in the years ahead. Of the top five economies in the world today, four of them are still from what we call the developing world, and only one, uh, excuse me, the developed world, and only one developing country is in that top five, and that's China. But within about three to four decades of the top five countries, four of them will be from what we call the developing world, and only one will be from today's developed world, and that's the United States. So we can, we can see that the, the turn has begun. That much we know. What we don't know is what this shift in the global distribution of power will mean for how the world works. By what rules will this new world play? How will we arrive at a new system for managing global governance when there are new voices and new seats at the table? Uh, that, I think, is the, the core question that we need to debate today. Uh, let me just define it a little more sharply by posing four specific questions that I hope our panelists will return to. One is, I, I think there are, there are two positions that have emerged in public debate about this. One is that the world in which we live today that has been designed principally by the Atlantic democracies, this world is stable. And the task before us is to bring rising powers into the tent. An alternative view is that as rising powers emerge, they will have their own views, interests, norms, and values. And the system that we live in today will have to be modified. I would like to ask our panelists which of these two models they think uh, uh, is most correct, and if this modification has to take place, what rules need to change? And in specific, do they have different views about how issues like Mali, Syria, or Libya should be handled? Uh, second, what we're talking about is not just a change in authority, but a redistribution of responsibility. What kind of tasks are emerging powers ready to take on when it comes to the provision of global goods. Third, I'd be interested to hear among yourselves, where are the areas in, of agreement and disagreement? When the BRICS countries get together, where are you aligned and where do you diverge? 
And finally, I think it would be helpful, especially for this crowd, to have your opinions on what we Western democracies can do better. Do you think we're sufficiently accommodating or making room for rising powers? We have a wonderful uh, pan set of panelists to discuss these. To my immediate right is Song Tao, the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs from China. Next will be Shiv Shankar Menon, the National Security Advisor from India. The third panelist, Antonio Patriota, the Minister of External Affairs from Brazil. And finally, Dr. Ung, who's the Minister of Defense from Singapore, a wealth of diplomatic experience. And we even have a former surgeon uh, on the panel, which I think is uh, unusual for a defense minister. Minister Sung, please. Thank you very much. Danjing, sorry, I speak in Chinese. So. <laughs> I'm waiting for. Danjingxia. Danjingxia. Ready? A major development in the world today is the rapid growth of a large number of developing countries represented by China, India, Brazil, South Africa, and Indonesia, etc. While developed countries still maintain overall This is something unseen in world history over the past several hundred years. How emerging economies and developing co developed countries manage their relations will shape the future of the world. This is also an issue high on the agenda of global governance. Here I wish to make the following points. Over the past decades, by conducting reform and innovation at home and opening up for cooperation with other countries, developing countries have adapted themselves to new trends in globalization and steadily grown in strength. Instead of taking long vacations and excessive social benefits, people in developing countries have worked hard year after year, creating miracles one after another and bringing about dramatic changes to their countries. China is a vivid example. Emerging economies are the positive energy for promoting peace, stability, and development in the world. They have made the pie of the world economy bigger. Figures show that emerging economies have contributed to over 50% of global growth over the past um, five years. Without the part played by the emerging economies, the world economy plagued by the international financial crisis and the European debt crisis could have been in much worse shape. Thanks to the fast growth of emerging economies for the first time in human history, nearly three billion people are leading a better life. This is a great blessing for the world. They have grown within the current international system and they ride in the same boat with developed countries. To ensure the smooth voyage of this boat is in the interest of all countries. Emerging economies are not free riders. They have made important contribution to advancing the global development agenda and seeking solutions to hotspot issues. The number of UN peacekeepers from BRICS countries is five times that from the seven major industrialized countries. At the same time, they also call for reforming the international economic and financial order to increase the representation and voice of the developing countries so that it can better reflect the reality of the world. As they continue to grow, emerging economies will take a more active part in international affairs to promote international cooperation and tackle global challenges such as climate change, environmental pollution, and food security, and to work, strengthen, work to strengthen global governance. It is fair to say that emerging economies are force for peace, stability, prosperity, and development of the world, and for building a just and equitable international order. As they are still quite behind developed countries, emerging economies should shoulder common but differentiated responsibilities. To ask emerging economies to assume the same international responsibilities as developed countries is to ask a passenger who boards the train at Frankfurt to pay the full fare for the journey from London to Munich. This is not fair and it, this is beyond the capability of emerging economies. 
The trend towards a multipolar world is gaining momentum. Gone are the days when one country or a few countries were the center of the world. In a globalized world today, countries share interwoven interests and cannot do without each other. It is not desirable to view the world from the outdated perspective of dichotomy or a zero-sum game. To adapt to a changing world, it is important for a country to run its own affairs well. China and other emerging economies have successfully met the basic living needs of nearly half of the world's population. Instead of being a burden to the world, emerging economies have provided with large markets and developed indicators. This is their greatest contribution to human society. If every country runs its own affairs well, the world as a whole will become a more harmonious and better place. When a country is in trouble, it should examine itself rather than blame others for its problems. Emerging economies and developed countries should inclu be inclusive to and learn from each other. The success of emerging economies show that they have found a path compatible with their national conditions and adopted sound and tailor-made policies and practices, as well as absorbed the good practices from the West. I know there is a lot of interest in where China is heading. This is my answer. China will continue to be an independent country seeking cooperation. The Chinese leaders have called for achieving the great renewal of the Chinese nation, which is China's dream in the new era. To make this dream a reality, we Chinese need to work really hard, but we also need the support and help of the world. China needs the world, the world also needs China. China will continue to promote the common development of all countries in the course of pursuing its own development. China will shoulder international responsibility, commensurate with position and development capability. China will continue to be a confident country, open to the world. Its accomplishments in the past three decades of reform and opening are recognized by the whole world, and we are rightly confident in our own path, theories, and system. But we are also keenly aware that China remains the largest developing country in the world. Its level of development is still quite low, and its per capita GDP is still around the 90th place in the world. And China will meet daunting challenges in its development endeavors. We will therefore continue the policy of reform and opening, break new ground, and draw upon all the good experience and practices of other countries. We will neither look down upon ourselves nor be conceited. China will remain committed to peace and development. This is both the trend of the world and what China must do to grow itself. For China and the world, without peace, there can be no smooth development, and without development, there can be no durable peace. I see that some panelists speak good Chinese. You may know that harmony is central to the Chinese culture. The Chinese character for He, which means peace and harmony, consists of two parts, millet and mouth, and this character has been established for thousands of years. It means that if no one goes hungry, the world will be at peace. And what win-win situation is about is to make everyone better off. Learning something about Chinese culture will help gain a better understanding of China's policies. Learning something about China's past will give you a better sense of its future. We sincerely hope to work with all other countries to strengthen global governance and build a harmonious world of enduring peace and common prosperity. Thank you very much, Ambassador Manu. Thank you. Let me just make a few quick points to, uh, to start the discussion of. To begin with, I'm not sure that the description rising powers fits those who are normally referred to as such in, in Western discourse. Many of the so-called rising powers think of themselves as actually restoring the historical norm in terms of the international hierarchy or distribution of power. Uh, in India, most of us choose to be more modest, describing our main task for a long time to come as our domestic development, rather than any revisionist attempt to reorder the world. Uh, maybe emerging powers, or better still, re-emerging powers is uh, safer and slightly less condescending way to describe these countries. 
But the problem, I think, with the, the argument is largely in the minds of, of those who choose to comment on this. Because of, of the European historical experience since Westphalia, when four out of the five transitions of power from one dominant power to another has involved conflict, there's an assumption that the rest of the world has to follow the same rules, and friction or even conflict is inevitable as we move towards a flatter distribution of power in the world. But to my mind, both empirical experience and logic suggest that, that, that the readjustment can be smooth. In the last 20 years, we've already seen breathtaking changes in the distribution of economic power in the world. And these occurred peacefully and relatively smoothly. Secondly, no emerging power is predicting the imminent decline of Western dominance. Thirdly, the world is now interdependent, globalized, and where political and military power, too, are no longer as closely or monopolistically held as in the past. So self-interest alone should ensure that friction is minimized. Uh, so I suppose it's natural that those who, who worry about the readjust, uh, readjustment in, in power and therefore possibly in decision making uh, look to global governance to, to prevent it. But the fact is that today, and this is part answer to your question, the world today actually suffers from a deficit of global governance. In most areas, global governance is notice, notable by its absence. There's no shortage of international institutions. There are over 300 multilateral institutions today in the world. But their legitimacy is declining and their effectiveness is questionable. By no stretch of imagination can the main multilateral institutions charged with responsibility for peace and security, like the UN Security Council, be called democratic or representative. There's also very little evidence of global governance in the management of relations between major powers or in the handling of crises, take Libya or Syria for that matter. In, and we've seen a progressive militarization of international politics and of the instruments that some members of the international community apply to crises and problems. Now I realize, of course, that uh, established powers are not going to happily hand over or share power with emerging countries unless essentially unpredictable elements beyond their control in the global economy of politics makes this in their self-interest. But to expect otherwise is to, would be to expect too much or to expect human nature to be kept in abeyance. But at the same time, none of the emerging powers is claiming the right to run the world or is laying down a new set of rules for global governance. None of them has described an alternate vision of the global order or offered itself as the city on the hill. They, they have relativistic or hierarchical strategic cultures which are non-proselytizing and realist in nature. So their expectations of others are low and they have historically shown little inclination to improve, convert, or democratize others. This is partly because the emerging powers have been among the major beneficiaries of aspects of the present international order, particularly economic integration and globalization and the use of the global commons. Whether this will remain so in the future is an issue when international peace and security is more challenged than it has been for a long time, when new patterns of global responses are called for in new domains of contention, like cyberspace, outer space, and so on, and where new economic initiatives are essential to address larger issues of energy security, food security, and so on. So I suppose my short answer to the question implicit in our topic is that global governance would be a good idea, but there's no imminent sign of it breaking out. The, the emerging countries would certainly like improvements in the world and the way it's run, making it more democratic and responsive to the needs of the vast majority of those who inhabit this planet. But what we seek is reform in the way issues are managed.
I do not hear emerging countries ask calling for a revolution. Rationally speaking, reform of global governance in itself should not worry any but the most died in the world conservative. Surely it's in our common interest to improve the way the international community conducts its affairs, strengthening purposeful multilateralism in international law. What we might seek is not a utopian system of systems to manage the world or to mimic internal governance internationally. What we might try instead is building the habits, the institutions, and the architecture to work together democratically in the international community. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Patriota. Well, maybe I'll start by agreeing with you that uh, the world is undergoing a tremendous change. Uh, perhaps what has been underestimated is the pace at which, at which uh, this change is taking place. And uh, one of the conclusions of the National Intelligence Council's report on global trends points out uh, this very aspect, which only highlights the importance of uh, adapting global governance to the changes that are indeed taking place. And to some extent, I think uh, the international community has been responding in ways that uh, demonstrate awareness of this challenge. If you look at the WTO, for example, uh, since the Cancun Conference of 2003, uh, the so-called WTO G20 was formed, where a number of uh, developing countries simply decided not to uh, proceed any longer within the established format of the so-called Quad, uh, dictating uh, what the outcomes should be, the Quad being integrated by the European Union, the United States, Canada, and Japan. So that was a major shift, and uh, no one at the WTO thinks of going back. And now that Russia, Russian Federation is a member, I think the possibilities for coordination within rising or emerging economies uh, within that uh, multilateral uh, trading system have increased. If you look at economic and financial cooperation, well, there have been very significant developments as well. And at Pittsburgh, the G20 uh, became what is today known as a premier uh, context or mechanism for cooperation on economic and financial issues. No one uh, is... Um, thinking of going back to the days where the G7 or G8 will deal exclusively uh, with such cooperation. The fact that the G8 and the G7 continue to meet um, is uh, a curiosity in itself, and I wonder for how much longer, but maybe uh, the day will come when it will stop meeting. And one of the challenges here, I believe, is for the G173, or meaning all of those who are not part of the G20, also feel that their uh, ideas and views are being taken into consideration. I believe the UN can provide a venue for that. Uh, similarly, if you look at the sustainable development or environmental agenda, um, the awareness is there. And Rio Plus 20, which the Brazilian government hosted last year in Rio, um, took some decisions on the establishment of a high-level forum for dealing with the three pillars of sustainable development, economic growth, social progress, and uh, the environmental agenda per se. The UN has yet to respond, but a process has been initiated, and uh, we have reason to believe that it will um, produce uh, improved governance in that uh, crucial area of international cooperation that involves climate change, among other things, as well. Now, where the world has not been responding adequately, uh, in our view, is in the peace and security area. And this is probably because of what was known as the unipolar moment, uh, where multilateralism seemed to come under threat through unilateral action, unilateral action that did not, um, in fact, produce the desired outcomes, I think it is uh, arguable to say, in Iraq and Afghanistan, in other uh, parts of the world. Um, I heard the Minister for Defense of Germany opening um, this uh, Munich conference by saying, quoting Bismarck and saying that, well, uh, wisdom lies in recognizing the limits of power. And I think today we are probably witnessing a more favorable international environment to tackle Security Council reform, given um, the very manifest limitations of unilateralism and given also a growing recognition, um, something that I often hear said, there is no military solution to this situation or to that situation. The limits to military solutions uh, across the board or exclusively military solutions. What does that imply? It implies that 
we should look at improved multilateral cooperation, and we should look at diplomacy and peaceful means for resolving conflicts in a more serious way. I'd like to believe that this opens the way for improved governance also in peace and security. And uh, what I would argue is that, in fact, it is not only in the interest of rising powers or emerging powers, but uh, very much in the interest of the established powers, because it will afford for greater legitimacy, uh, greater effectiveness, and also greater stability and predictability. Um, let's face it, the existing powers are not sinking powers. Quite the contrary. Uh, there was a panel here at Munich that dealt with the new uh, geopolitics of energy. The United States is an extremely strong economy. It's now going to become energy sufficient again, and uh, that uh, provides it with a, a whole new uh, array of instruments with which to remain a very powerful uh, nation internationally. Europe is also going to overcome its current difficulties. So what we need is a system where the existing and the rising nations can cooperate so that multipolarity uh, can be used as an opportunity for a more peaceful, more stable world where we can concentrate on challenges such as climate change, development, eradication of poverty, food security, among many others. And to answer very briefly some of the questions that you put to us, uh, Mr. Kukchan, um, let me say that um, I think your first question uh, implies something that is questionable in itself. Uh, will the rising powers emerge uh, abiding by the existing system? I think it is the existing powers that have not always followed international law uh, strictly. Uh, so, in this sense, uh, countries such as Brazil, without weapons of mass destruction, a democracy that lives in a very peaceful environment, uh, our greatest wish is for the international community to abide by the UN Charter, to cooperate within uh, the UN framework, and to find ways of working multilaterally through diplomacy. Uh, what tasks are uh, rising countries ready to take? Well, uh, emerging powers are assuming a greater parcel of uh, the responsibility for development and for um, growth in the world economy. They're assuming leadership in a variety of ways. I mentioned Rio Plus 20, where Brazil uh, took a leadership role in uh, promoting the notion of uh, sustainable development. I think that countries such as Brazil and others um, in this panel can be forces for change um, in favor of multilateralism and diplomacy, and that is already visible. Agreement, disagreement within the BRICS? Well, there is a broad platform within the BRICS where we work together, but it's not a coalition or uh, an alliance in, in any sense. And there is room for agreement and disagreement. This is the way the BRICS countries were conceived. There, are, there is not a unique view, for example, when it comes to Security Council reform. And uh, we are yet to reach a consensus, but we will continue trying very hard. And what can the Western uh, democracies do better? Well. One of the things this group is doing is listening to the rising or the emerging countries, and I'm very happy to have been invited. In fact, the first time a Brazilian foreign minister comes to Munich. Thank you very much. Minister Ong. Thank you, uh, Professor Kupchen. Uh, let me just uh, uh, first say that it's a pleasure to be in Munich and uh, with my fellow panelists. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to share views on this topic. Um, I also want to start with a declaration in Munich that Singapore is and never will be, is not and never will be a rising power. <laughs> For those of you who have been to Singapore, we're 700 square kilometers. Actually, at Independence, we were 600 square kilometers. We've added 100 kilometers to reclamation uh, within territorial limits service, <laughs> and uh, five million people. But what Singapore is, it is a canary in the mine of global trade. And we are subject, uh, even hostage, to the global commons, the rules, and the consequences, and certainly uh, uh, shifts in geopolitics and changes in power. And from where Singapore sits, uh, the rise of China and India has already impacted us in our region in fundamental ways. And I just need to give uh, some figures in trade. Prior to China's ascension to the WTO in 2001, ASEAN, 10 member states, about 600 million people, GDP about 1.6 trillion now, ASEAN's top trading 
three trading partners were United States, Japan, and the EU in that order. China is now ASEAN's largest trading partner. China is also the largest trading partner of Australia, Japan, and South Korea. Between ASEAN and China, two-way trade has increased almost tenfold over the last decade. It's now about 300 US billion dollars, compared to about 200 billion for US and EU, about 240 billion. I think all of us recognize that China has become the leading manufacturer of the world and it has flooded markets with uh, made in China goods. But I also like to point out that there is another, another tsunami coming in about 10 years time from China. In 10 years time, China expects to have nearly 200 million college and university graduates. Then four out of every 10 university graduates will come from just two countries, China and India. I think this will have a profound impact on all of us, on the flow of trade, talent across borders, not only in our region, but I think globally. Against this backdrop, I, I would like to make two points. The first is that the US-China relationship is central, indeed pivotal to global stability. The US-China relationship sets the overall context for other bilateral and multilateral relationships that we talked about. Understandably, it is the key preoccupation for us in ASEAN and the wider region. Um, my learned colleague, Dr. Antonio, says that we have to uh, you know, both accommodate rising and, rest and emerging powers, and that's absolutely true. We must accommodate both U.S. interests in the Pacific as a resident power and China as a rising power. Hillary Clinton and President Xi Jinping have both stated that the Pacific is big enough quote unquote, to accommodate both powers. I think that's a decent start, but certainly more needs to be done. We recognize that strategic competition between US and China is a reality, but this does not exclude and indeed necessitates that there be stronger cooperation between China and US to ensure global stability. The US-China bilateral relationship must widen areas of mutual interest, the strategic and economic dialogue has made progress but needs to be upsized in programs and practical outcomes in the field of trade, commerce, cultural exchanges, people-to-people -people interactions and military collaboration. For security, the US and China can build confidence and capacity in multilateral settings. I think both uh, Minister Shushanka and Dr. Antonio talked about this. And we talked about how Existing institutions, uh, I, I like the point that Shivshankar said there's no shortage of uh, multilateral institutions, and I agree. Uh, and we need to have credible results from institutions and leadership counts. I give you just one example of an evolving architecture in response to the shifts in, 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 uh, in to accommodate uh, resident and rising powers. And this is the ASEAN Defense Ministers meeting. We felt uh, the 10 ASEAN members and our plus partners, of eight partners of US, China, India, South Korea, Japan, New Zealand, Russia, that there was a deficit in programs that allowed military to military interactions. And uh, Brunei is hosting ASEAN this year. And for the first time uh, in, in the middle of this year, there will be an 18 nation full troop exercise in Brunei with the themes on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and military medicine. Here, militaries of ASEAN countries, US, China, India, Japan, Australia, and others will participate. I think this will be the first full through multilateral exercises that involve countries like US and China. Singapore also believes that the Asia Pacific region can benefit from the involvement of EU nations. The EU is a long standing dialogue partner of ASEAN and an active participant in the ASEAN Regional Forum. My second point, I'd like to just make some brief comments on effective global governance that I think my other co-panelists have spoken on. I think that it should be anchored on three main principles. First, the global government framework should be open and inclusive and allow countries, big or small, to have a voice. Uh, I'm glad that Dr. Antonio talked about uh, um, the G20 and 
This is the reason why uh, Singapore pushed for a connection between the G20 and the UN in the form of the Global Governance Group or the 3G Group. Uh, it was the same reason why Singapore pushed in 1992 for the Forum of Small States at the United Nations. Second, I think the principle is the rule of law must be the bedrock of global governance. And we have to adhere to international law and international dispute resolu resolution mechanisms. And finally, I think in order for the international institutions to be credible, they must deliver real results. And this is a riposte to Shushanka's point that there is no shortage. And indeed, I think uh, frameworks and institutions are necessary, but insufficient and you need effective leadership. Thank you for your attention. We will uh, begin the questions by turning to uh, one of our young leaders, Lynn Kwok, who is a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. And she will be asking the question live. Most insightful panel. Um, in looking at the issue of uh, rising powers and global governance, the underlying question is really whether or not the ascent of these powers will impact um, the current status quo and um, undermine global security. We heard this morning from President, uh, Vice President Joe Biden that the US does not consider China to be a threat. But we also see that this takes place alongside a buildup of military capabilities in um, the Asia Pacific region and um, a strengthening of its ties with traditional allies and partners. We heard from Minister Ng from Singapore earlier. Um, there are also calls within the U.S. for a more muscular approach uh, to, towards China's bo China, both in the economic and military spheres. So my question is directed to Vice Minister Song. What is the perception within China of whether the U.S. considers China to be a threat and seeks to hamper its development? I know that bilateral tensions often result in very strident voices against the West, particularly the U.S., and if I may also direct my, question, my next question to the moderator, Professor um, Kupchen. Do you think the US and Europe are willing or even able to accommodate um, a rising China, notwithstanding ideological differences? Is political reform a necessary prerequisite before China is fully embraced as part of the political, uh, as part of the international order? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me add a couple of uh, additional questions to you, uh, Vice Minister, because they're quite related to what Lynn uh, just asked. Uh, one is from Charles Powell, and he asks, has the Chinese definition of core interests expanded recently? It used to be focused more on Taiwan, Tibet. Does it now include islands, uh, and if so, how does China think one should go about ensuring that these disputes are resolved peacefully through negotiation rather than through force? Uh, and that's from Toshiko Abe, the parliamentary uh, vice minister for, for foreign affairs. Uh, and one other question that may be related. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned the, the concept of harmony in uh, Chinese foreign policy. This comes from Philippe Herrera from France. What does harmony mean in the uh, uh, approach to, to cyberspace in terms of uh, Chinese policies on that front? Between China and the US, the relationship between the two countries has attracted a lot of attention. China is the biggest developing country, and the U.S. is the biggest developed country. China-U.S. relationship is the most important and the most complicated set of relationships in the world. And how the two countries can handle this relationship has gone beyond bilateral scope. It, is, it matters to peace, stability, and prosperity of the region, the world at large. <laughs> 
I don't believe that the two countries are bound to confrontation and conflict, such traditional pattern. I don't think they will take this path because this underestimates the wisdom of the Chinese and American people. It also underestimates the will of the whole world to uphold peace and stability. It also underestimates the pursuit of the world for peace, development. In fact, China and the US in a lot of areas have a lot of common understanding. Such common understanding far outweighs their differences. At the moment, our two countries have a lot of mechanisms for communication and exchange. In many areas, we have consensus and common interests. There is a one big consensus between China and the United States. That is, both countries are working hard to build a cooperative partnership based on mutual benefit and mutual respect. This is a new type of new relationship between major countries. Cyber harmony. <laughs> Apologies for that. So, I think this. Therefore, I believe. China needs to continue on the path of peace for development. And prosperity is the trend of the times. To follow the path of peaceful development is a decision that China made in light of the trend of the times and in light of its own development needs. The Chinese people love peace. In history, it was subject to aggression and bullying. We deeply value peace. The Chinese people are afraid of instability. We pursue stability. We know that without peace, there can be no smooth development for either China or the world. China contributes to world peace with its own development. And China's rapid development and the significant increase in people's welfare show that China has chosen the right path of peaceful development, and it, is, it will continue along this path, whether or not a country poses any threat to other countries, we'll have to look at the policies pursued by these countries. The path of peaceful development has been included into the political report to the 18th Party Congress. So the path of peaceful development is a very good continuation of the fine tradition of the Chinese nation. I remember Prime Minister Schmidt once said that a review of China's history shows that China has never set up a colony in other countries, and China has never snatched an inch of soil on foreign countries. So China is committed to this independent part foreign policy of peace. It does not engage in hegemony or expansion. It will always be a staunch force for world peace and development. China's development and the development of the world go hand in hand. Uh, we will pursue the common interest of the entire mankind while we seek our own development. We will turn the opportunities presented by the development of the world into our own opportunities and vice versa. And we will break new ground as we move ahead and contribute 
even more greatly to world peace and stability. Of course, the path of peaceful development does not mean that we have to sacrifice our core interests. The path of peaceful development is the policy that China pursues, and the path of peaceful development should also be a policy pursued by other countries. Only in this way can we have peace and stability in the world. To uphold peace is the common responsibility of all countries and require joint efforts of all countries. Concerning a cyber issue, I don't know if you know a figure. In China, there are 538 million internet users. Every day, there are about 200 million people using microblog, close to the population of the United States. And on the internet, the Chinese citizens have raised a lot of suggestions, recommendations, as well as criticisms. I think without the support of the Chinese government and the administration from the Chinese government, the rapid growth of the Internet would not have not been possible. In the process of development, the Chinese government has drawn upon a lot of valuable suggestions raised on the Internet. We have taken into a lot of considerations of the important views on the Internet in revising our policies. And this is a very important aspect in the governance in China and the Chinese citizens feel free to criticize the government and express their own views. Of course, freedom is a relative term. It is not absolute. We have to have a legal framework, and the cyberspace also has rules. The Chinese government follows the laws to govern the Internet sphere. We're committed to cooperation with other countries to build a healthy, secure, and orderly Internet sphere. With regard to the neighboring areas, I think there is a lot of interest. China may be uh, one of the countries that have the most uh, neighboring countries. It has about uh, 22,000 kilometers of borders with other countries, and it has 18,000 kilometers of coastal line facing a lot of countries. So the neighborhood of China is an area that is um, most uh, complicated in the world. We all know that to give the Chinese people a better life and for China to achieve development, a favorable external environment is required, in particular, a favorable neighboring environment. The Chinese government has always pursued the policy of good neighborliness and friendship. China has worked with Central Asia, South Asia, and East Asia to build very good cooperative and friendly relations. And in the Asia-Pacific region, the region has become the most dynamic region in the world. Without peace and without a stable environment, Rapid economic development would not have been possible. Of course, when you have a lot of neighbors, the differences and frictions are inevitable, but these problems, differences are all sporadic and are, uh, are under control. They do not represent the whole picture. In this region, it is a big stage for cooperation. Countries are dancing to pursue cooperation and harmony. They may step on their, the toes of each other, but with mutual understanding and better coordination, such incidents will be reduced. 
stepping on the toes of each other will become fewer and fewer. I think Asia will always be a cooperation stage. It will never be a stage for the gladiators. Thank Let you. Let me uh, turn to the issue of resource management, of climate change, questions from uh, Mr. Butikoffer, a member of European Parliament, Claudia Roth from the Green Party. What suggestions uh, would you have for managing what could be compete, uh, gr growing competition over resources, over food, over arable land, over water? What forms of global governance or uh, new means of global governments come to mind? Uh, and in particular, I'd, I'd like to pick up on something you said, uh, Ambassador Menon, about the deficit of global governance that you expect. Uh, if that's the case, do you believe that when it comes to resources as well as other issues, that we should increasingly look to regional rather than uh, global organizations? Uh, also picking up on something that Dr. Ung said uh, when it came to the question of ASEAN. Well, I think that's a huge area, but I think what I was trying to suggest is that part of the problem with the way we've dealt with climate change, for instance, is that we've tried to mimic our internal government structures and tried to apply them globally and tried to find one-size-fits-all solutions to, to global problems. And I think it's much easier to actually deal with it at several levels. There's a technology issue at national levels. Most of us are very ambitious, actually, in terms of what we're trying to do in terms of renewable energy, in terms of what we're trying to do to clean up water, air, and so on. But when you try and squeeze everybody into one big international framework, into a very heavy governance structure, as it were, I think we've had trouble, and that's why we haven't got anywhere. And this is why I said we need to actually disaggregate the problem into, into bits that are manageable and that can be tackled, and also develop the habits of consultation. I think a lot of the problem is what Mr. Patriota said. You have 173 countries who think they're outside the G20, who think they're not really part of it. Even within the G20, there are people who think that they weren't really part of the negotiation on the climate change issues. So we need to find new ways of actually dealing with this, which don't involve heavy governance solutions necessarily. And it's not as though you need to create a whole new complex structure which is going to govern this, this issue at all. But I do think we need to start looking at it slightly differently from what we did. Now, you listed a whole series of things, resources, food, energy. I mean, I think we need to have conversations about this, which we haven't done so far. Because, and there, I think, it's partly because some people are happy with the way things work today, and others aren't. And I don't think there is any global mechanism for actually getting us around the table to talk about that about how that could change. And that's the real deficit. When we say there's a, there's a deficit of global governance, I think that's where there's a real deficit. There's nowhere to go to actually sort these issues out. And if we leave it to individual relations between countries, then you never know when it's going to become fractious and much more difficult to deal with. Minister Patriota, Minister, would you like to comment on these issues? Of resource management and uh, well, I think that we're experiencing a time um, when the awareness of the importance of coordination on issues such as climate change and resource management is increasing, uh, which only points to the importance of establishing mechanisms uh, that actually produce results. Mm -hmm. To some degree, we are achieving results. Uh, the uh, Copenhagen, Cancun, Durban, Doha process ultimately resulted in uh, an extension of the Kyoto Protocol, and it established a um, roadmap for a subsequent regime dealing uh, with climate change, for instance. And we are very much committed to that. But maybe the point that I'd like to make at this stage is that um, governance, uh, as much as we improve it, can attain so much. I think the other question is leadership also, and that involves producing, electing leaders worldwide that can, uh, are actually ready to take risks and to look at the, the common good and to look at the future that humanity faces in a number of areas. Um, I think you could say that there perhaps is a deficit of bold leadership today in the world. 
because obviously some of the decisions will be unpopular. Um, this is why also I think we need to evolve towards a system where civil society uh, is more vocal, where civil society participates more actively. Uh, take an issue that is not part of the agenda here at Munich, to my surprise, but which I find is very much at the core of the entire instability in the Arab world today, which is Israel-Palestine peace process. Um, well, uh, we have the Oslo uh, uh, Accords, we have the United Nations, we have the Quartet. What we don't have is leadership to actually tackle and to move forward this agenda. Anything to add, or shall we take more, another question? Okay, why don't uh, I call on Her Excellency Okanjo Iweala, the Minister of Finance from Nigeria, to pose a question from the floor. There's a microphone coming. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I was listening when the external affairs minister from Brazil said he was happy to be invited uh, for the first time. And I'm looking at the 49th uh, security conference. I hope by the 50th, Africa will be duly invited. Uh, because a lot of issues that have been posed here have to do with the continent. Um, Africa is almost a billion people, so it's not that far from taking the whole continent, from China and India. 60% uh, of its population is under 30, so we have a resource, if properly managed, uh, that can really uh, be good for global growth. I mean, China will have an aging problem, and as many developed countries will also have. We are growing at better than 5%, have been doing so for a decade, and according to IMF forecasts, will continue to do so. Um, and even though there may be one or two conflicts, I want people to note that 33 countries on the continent have had more than one election and are still gradually becoming stable democracies. So my question is, how do you see the continent on this spectrum of emerging powers? Um, you know, what, what does its absence from the conversation signify? even when one of the topics or the key topics have to do with questions of security around a good part of that part of the world. So I just want to introduce this notion uh, of a seat at the table and hear the views from the moderator and our panelists about the prospects of Africa emerging. Thank you very much. Would someone like to Take a crack at that one. You want Singapore to start? Yes, the Singapore would be an excellent place to start. Well, we, we trade with anyone. <laughs> so I would support your view. <laughs> <laughs> that was a wise answer. <laughs> anyone else like to comment on I'm, I'm always very happy to speak about Africa. Please. <laughs> um, in fact, I was thinking as I listened to some of the debates and I hear a lot the uh, expression, the transatlantic relationship. Uh, to me, well, every country, every region has its blind spots, but maybe it would be more precise to say the North transatlantic relationship because there's a South Atlantic, which is very different, and it has just met at Montevideo uh, around the project called the Zone of Peace and Cooperation in the <laughs> South Atlantic. 21 African countries were invited the South Atlantic uh, nations of Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina were invited. Uh, we're all uh, denuclearized, uh, free of weapons of mass destruction, looking at ways to cooperate in peace, development, food security, and other areas. Um, it's very fortunate that someone from Africa raised uh, their voices because some of the fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa today. It's a, a continent of extraordinary promise. Um, it is a continent that is still um, struggling to overcome many of the wounds left behind by uh, colonization. And I think the international community should um, follow and engage very closely with Africa as it develops and as it experiences a, a true renaissance. Let me, let me uh, pose uh, two related questions. Uh, one to Minister Song that has to do with modes of, of cooperation looking forward. Charles Grant notes that China has historically been willing 
to play by institutionalized rules on trade, such as through the WTO, but has been more reluctant to engage in multilateral uh, institutions when it comes to security, particularly on arms control. Do you see that changing in the years ahead, both on conventional and nuclear issues? And to the other members of the panel, I'd like to return to an issue that uh, Lynn Kwok raised at the very beginning, and that is when you look out at global governance, at solving problems, at partnerships, do you look internally, do you look at countries and judge them as partners, partly based upon their regimes, whether they're democracies, how they play by the rules at home, or would you say, let's go out and work with whatever country we can that's willing to cooperate? How important is this question uh, of regime type to the broader challenges that we face of, of building new institutions of global governance? Would you like to start, Vice Minister? Uh, thank you for the question. In my earlier remarks, I said, that China and other emerging economies. Should be waiting. Okay. In my early remarks, I said that China and other emerging economies have grown within the current international system. And China is an advocate and a contributor to the current international system. We believe that to maintain the overall stability of the current international system is in the interest of China and the other countries. Of course, as the world continues to develop, with the development of rising powers, in order to reflect the new reality, China believes that we should follow the principle of gradualism in our effort to advance the reform of the international system and make it fairer and more equitable. I would like to correct a point by the moderator that uh, China is not unwilling to participate in the international system. My attendance at MSC shows that we are willing to participate in the international system. In fact, with the development of China, going forward, China will take a more active part in international affairs. In addition, we will honor our obligations as a responsible power with the development of a comprehensive strength. China will take more international responsibilities commensurate with our capacity. At the moment, in terms of international governance, the most important thing is to provide more equal and fairer environment for development of developing countries. We need to weather the storms, like passengers in the same boat, share responsibilities, and establish a more equal global development partnership, specifically, number one, Necessary reform need to be conducted on the UN to increase its authority and efficiency and increase its capacity to deal with global challenges. Number two, we need to increase global economic governance, reform international financial institutions, increase the representation and say of developing countries in these institutions. So number three, we need to transform G20 as an emergency re response mechanism to a long-term mechanism for global economic governance. Number four, we need to pay greater attention to development of developing countries, such as in Africa. We need to attach great importance to Africa's development, provide more assistance for them.
give them more support and help them address the gap between the north and the south. Last but not least, we need to explore the possibility of the establishment of a more balanced global development partnership. Thank you. I'm not sure I understood that question. Were you saying how, how far does the nature of the regimes that you deal with affect the way you deal with them? Because frankly, as I was trying to say, it seems to me that, that emerging powers haven't had the luxury of being able to choose I mean, who they deal with. And given the, the, the structure of, of the distribution of power in the world, I think it's logical that we deal with who we find. But I do think that it's important for global governance to be representative. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a shame and it's really a loss that Africa isn't represented, for instance, in the institutions of global governance and, and the instu in the UN Security Council, for instance. I think that's important. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that the, the, the question that you asked, whether, whether we have the luxury of saying we won't deal with the world until it looks the way we want it to look like. I, I don't think that's, that's available to us. Well, if I can give a perspective from ASEAN, uh, 10 member states, uh, which are quite com completely different in terms of per capita, for example, per capita of 500 US dollars to 50,000, different uh, histories, uh, French, British, Dutch influence, uh, separated by uh, great geographic distances and various developments, differences in development. And uh, we had always started with the principle that we had to be inclusive. And if you cast your mind back on uh, the, the issues involving ASEAN when uh, questions about Myanmar was brought up, uh, ASEAN member states had always responded by saying that we needed to be patient and it was far better for Myanmar to be part of ASEAN than it was for Myanmar to be outside ASEAN. And I think time has proven that to be true in, in, in terms of the recent developments. Uh, so no, uh, we don't necessarily look at the differences or expect differences within countries to be resolved before we form those regional groupings. But uh, we do have uh, a set of principles in which hopefully will guide us in agreeing on common areas that are for our mutual benefit. We only have a few minutes left, uh, so I'll give the last word to, to you, Minister Patriota. And I'm wondering if you could just leave us with your recommendations on the top two, three, four priorities of getting this question right moving forward. If we are going to manage this transition and the material distribution of power without seeing the erosion of the international system, what are the top two, three, four things we ought to be thinking about? Well, if you allow me, I'll comment very briefly on the previous question because I think it's an important one. Um, how do you engage internationally? Do you expect countries to be uh, to hold the same principles and values as yourself, or do you engage more broadly? I think it depends what you're engaging on. Uh, for example, as we work towards South American integration in my part of the world, um, the fact that the regimes today are all democratic has been an extraordinary inducement for closer ties among the countries. And when there is a democratic rupture, uh, we feel that this is a serious setback and that a joint position should be taken, which is why a joint position was taken, for example, uh, regarding Paraguay recently. But as you engage more broadly with the international community on matters of peace and security, for example, I think the essence of diplomacy is not only engaging with the like-minded, but also trying to bridge gaps and uh, produce solutions that will uh, promote stability, understanding, even if the other party doesn't necessarily uh, share all your values and principles. And, Maybe this is uh, why a country such as Brazil, well, we take pride in the fact that we have diplomatic relations with every single member of the United Nations, uh, and it's in this spirit that we engage. Now, looking towards the future, what are the top priorities for getting governance right? Um, I think being very aware of the speed of change that is taking place in the world economically, politically, in terms of global outreach that new powers have today, um, and allowing those who are actually eager to participate, well, to take a greater share of responsibility. 
Um, as I was saying, I believe that in many respects, this is already starting to happen at the WTO, through the G20, uh, through discussions on sustainable development, at FAO, uh, where there's a um, committee on food security, for example, that also taps into civil society. I think this is a, a, an interesting feature that will probably be more part of uh, the future um, governance mechanisms uh, that we establish. Uh, but my concluding remark would be on the importance and urgency of Security Council reform. I think we really cannot afford to go uh, for many more years with this stalemate. In fact, we are risking systemic failure if we don't reform the Security Council. Uh, we risk a scenario where you will have competing systems of collective security vying for um, authority around the world, and um, I can only imagine that this is a recipe for chaos. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the panel.